All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for our Navigating College prep session today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about applications, the counselor role in applications, and a little bit about student essays. Um, so our agenda, again, we're going to talk about um, kind of the timeline, components of applications. We're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the Common App. Um, we're going to talk specifically about counselors or educators' role in applications and some guidelines for some standout student essays and then best practices and wrap up. So my name is Samantha Jackson. I am a career readiness consultant for Ken ISD. Um, so we have five consultants on our team. Each of us is assigned to specific school districts within Kent County. Um, and our goal is really to help with any career readiness um, activities and, you know, just trying to make sure that students are well prepared for when they leave school. Um, but a little bit about myself, um, my background is actually in higher ed, so I have my master's in higher education and student affairs. Um, I worked in college career services for about eight years before I transitioned to this role. So my passion for this work really comes from working in college and meeting with those students once they were there and you know, working with them when they're trying to find jobs or go to grad school and we're talking about what they're doing and they're like, I have no idea why I'm here. I just came to college because someone told me to or I felt like I needed to. And so I got really interested in this work because I really wanted to help those students before they got to college. So I'm really excited to talk to you all today about um, applications and how to help students get there. As I mentioned, our mission is really to help prepare every student in Kent County, but of course we are you know, working with counselors across the state, um, but helping all students um, prepare for the world of work. So whether that's going to college or going straight to the workforce after school. And really we wanna help ensure that every student leaves their K-12 experience with a plan. So our work is not strictly with high schools. We work with um, kindergarten through 12th grade, again, all districts within Kent County. And like I said, every district does have an, a consultant assigned to them. So if you haven't met with them yet, if you wanna get connected to them, my email will be at the end. So you can feel free to send me a message and I'll make sure you get connected. Um, also a quick note, um, if you, this, like I said, this is being recorded and you'll be sent the recording afterwards, um, but this also is available for sketches after um, for people who are watching the recording. So if you are watching the recording and need sketches, there will be a sketch code in the middle that you'll need to put into the Google form. If you're watching this live, you don't need to worry about it. Just please make sure that your name on your Zoom is the same name or similar to what you signed up with so we can make sure that we can match those up. Um, please feel free with, uh, throughout also to throw any questions into the chat in the, um, or the Q&A, and I'll try to make sure that we get to those throughout. Um, and we'll also have some specific times for questions. But to get started, I wanted to kind of get a sense of who's in the room and where we're at, realizing that some people have been counselors for many, many years. Some people are brand new. Some people are out of the field and you know working on sketches. Some are in elementary or high school. Um, so let me back out of this here. Oops. So I wanted to start with this Jamboard. And if you haven't used Jamboard before, um, over here on the left-hand side, you'll see some options. And so we're just gonna use the sticky notes. You can click one, type in whatever you want and just put it on there. And so really what I wanna know is what are some of your greatest challenges when it comes to helping students through the college application or admissions process? So that could either be specific challenges working one-on-one -on -one with a student or as a counselor, you know, managing the load or whatever. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes to write out some thoughts and feel free to, you know, if someone said something that you were thinking, go ahead and like put another sticky note on top of that saying, yeah, me too. Um, and I've added a couple pages up here at the top. You can see this arrow. You can go to the second page if we're running out of room here. And I'm giving you just a, a minute or two to put some sticky notes on there. And once you put it on there, you can also click and move it around the screen.
Yeah, a lot of great things popping up. So I know, yeah, I know we have a couple of elementary and middle school counselors on here. So some refreshers and just making sure that students know there's the option. A lot of, yeah, lack of support at home, especially for those first gen students. I was a first gen student and, you know, my parents did everything they could, but obviously they had not been through the process. So really hard to help when you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, a lot of lack of support, first gen. And I think even as a first gen student, you know, sometimes when I was working with students, I would also forget, you know, again, that you don't know what you don't know. And so you really have to um, boil it down to the basics, um, you know, making sure that they understand all of the lingo. Yeah, definitely caseload as well. Yeah, definitely for middle school. And we're gonna talk about this later. You know, a lot of this process actually starts so much earlier than, you know, their junior or senior year and they have to start making those connections early. So really helping those middle schoolers understand that, you know, if this is an idea that they have for the future, they really have to start thinking early. Amazing, okay, I'm gonna keep this up. So if you have more thoughts, feel free to put them on here and I'll share the Jamboard as well. Um, but great, thank you. We're gonna be covering a lot of this stuff today. Um, <laughs> yes, don't have realistic expectations for where they can attend, absolutely. Okay, great. Switching back here. Hopefully my screen sharing is all going back and forth the way it's supposed to. All right, so like I said, I know that everyone is at a very different point. So, you know, for some of you, this is gonna seem pretty basic or you've been doing this for a long time, um, but I just wanna make sure we all have a good baseline and all, you know, understand all the different components. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is different types of applications um, and kind of admissions deadlines. So the first and most common is the regular admission. So this is where the school sets a deadline, students apply by that deadline, and all the applications are reviewed after that date. So usually this happens maybe, maybe late, late, late fall semester, but usually kind of early spring semester, so January, February, March. And then most students will get their decisions, you know, mid-March, April, to make a decision by May 1st. And so all students who apply regular admission Admissions counselors review all of those applications at the same time. Decisions aren't made until they're all reviewed and then those decisions are sent out together. Um, the second kind are rolling admissions. And this is kind of a first come first serve type of operation. Um, so they might have a priority deadline set, but really as soon as a student applies, they're going to review that application. And usually within just a couple of weeks, they'll have a decision. Um, so as soon as that class fills up, then it's done. Even if a qualified student applies later, they might not get a spot if it's already filled. Um, and so again, they might have a priority deadline set for maybe scholarship consideration or something like that, but otherwise those applications are just reviewed as they're coming in. Uh, then there's early decision. An early decision is the most restrictive form and students get confused between early decision and early action. So there is an important distinction Early decision is where students are really only supposed to apply to one school early decision um, because if they get accepted, they're bound, technically, it's a, a agreement is binding that they attend that school. And so that means they're not gonna be able to compare financial aid packages from different schools. So it's really important that students apply early decision if they're pretty dead set on going to that school no matter what. Um, there are some ways to get out of that agreement. Of course, they can't really force a student um, but if they, you know, go back on that agreement, schools do talk, they might talk to other schools and find out that they also applied early decision there. Um, so, you know, again, they're only supposed to apply to one school early decision. Um, they're not supposed to apply anywhere else. If they have applied anywhere else, you know, regular admission or early action, um, they're supposed to withdraw their applications from those schools. Um, early action, they can apply to multiple schools. Um, and it still will be considered before regular admission. So there still is a benefit to early action, um, but the thing with early decision and early action is they have much earlier deadlines. So usually November, maybe December, 
Um, so they do kind of have to be on top of things and get their application materials in early. But again, early decision, very restrictive, should only apply to one early action. They can apply to multiple schools. They can you know, compare financial aid packages before making a decision. Um, and then there's open admission. And so this is pretty common for community colleges, um, some more regional schools, uh, online schools, where pretty much any student who meets the requirements is going to be admitted. So this is really great for your students who maybe struggled their first few years of high school. Maybe they don't have a great GPA or test scores. Um, so it gives them an opportunity to start college somewhere. Um, a couple of other things to keep in mind. Um, there are also early evaluations. Um, so this isn't actually an application, but some schools will offer this evaluation where students can submit their materials and kind of get an idea of if they might be admitted or not. So it's not an, a decision, but it gives them kind of an idea if they would be admitted. Um, and there's also deferred admissions. So if a student you know, applied for the fall and then decides, oh, I wanna take a gap semester and do whatever, they can defer their admissions to a, another semester as well. All right, application timeline. So this is, very subjective. It's of course going to depend on the school, the application type, um, you know, the specific student, but this is just very general. So I've kind of got it broken down here, the darker green being kind of spring-ish junior year, and then moving into summer and fall of senior year, and then the bluish color being um, kind of spring senior year. So thinking about kind of spring junior year, um, students should be taking the SAT or ACT. And of course, in Michigan, all students get to take the SAT, so that's helpful. Um, but then after that, deciding, do they need to take it again? Is it worth it? Do they need their score to go up for you know, scholarships or admissions consideration? Um, if they haven't already, they should start making a list of the schools that they're interested in and connecting with those schools. So whether that's campus visits, you know, individually, group visits, a lot of schools have like junior days in the spring. Um, you know, making sure they're connecting with the admissions rep, um, just really making sure that they're making an informed decision and understanding where it is that they're applying to. Um, a lot of schools also have virtual visits now, which is helpful, um, especially if students are looking out of state. Then kind of moving into that summer slash fall of senior year, um, students should really be finalizing that list. Um, and we do have a whole other um, recorded PD on helping students make their list and, you know, finding schools that are good for them. Um, so I'll include that in the follow-up email um, in case you want to take a look at that. Um, during the summer is really when I recommend they start working on their personal statements. Um, you know, just like teachers tell them not to wait until the last minute to work on assignments. Same thing goes for personal statements. We don't want them sending in their first draft to a school. Um, so really getting started on those early. Um, and most schools will release their personal statement questions pretty early in the summer. Um, I think the common application, which we'll talk about later, um, usually releases at the end of the spring. Most schools at the very latest are releasing their stuff by August 1st. Um, starting to work on a resume or some type of activities list for their application. Starting to request letters of recommendation, which we're gonna talk more about later. Um, again, moving into that fall semester, requesting transcripts actually applying. So again, those earliest deadlines could be November 1st, um, but you know, just making sure that they're ready to apply in the fall semester. Uh, completing the FAFSA. So the FAFSA opens October 1st. So encouraging them to you know, complete it as soon as they can so they don't forget about it. And then as we're moving into the spring semester, making sure that they're preparing if the school has any interviews or if they're you know, auditioning for performing arts or dance or something like that. Um, making sure that they're getting all of that stuff ready. Applying for scholarships through the school, local scholarships, you know, anything that they find on the internet, um, any of those, and then submitting those final applications. So again, there are schools that have later deadlines or have rolling admissions that they could also apply to in the spring semester as well. All right, moving on, a lot of different types of application methods. And so one question that I got from students a lot is like, what is the best way to apply? 
And honestly, if a school accepts multiple types of applications, they generally don't really care how they apply. They just want the information. Um, whatever system they use, if they use multiple things, they're gonna get the information that they need. So the student should really do whatever they're most comfortable with, or honestly, whatever is going to make the process easier for them. So the first type of application um, is a school specific. So that's where they're going to the school website, filling out the application, putting it in. So they go to Michigan State University admissions, do it there and submit it. So that's gonna be kind of a one by one thing. Um, the second type are systems. Um, so a few systems that have this, um, like the State University of New York system, so SUNY, um, the University of California system, Cal State, and some schools like the University of California, I believe, only accept applications through their system applications. So they don't have school specific or they don't use the Common App or anything like that. You have to apply through the kind of system website. Um, the benefit of this is that students can apply to multiple schools at one time, um, but again, within a specific system. Um, the next is the Common Black College application. And so this is for historically Black colleges and universities. Um, there are 68 member schools for this application, um, and students can apply to all of those schools for $20, which is a pretty good deal. Um, so there aren't any fee waivers available, but again, their application is made available to all 68 of those schools. However, students do select their top four schools to kind of indicate their interest. Um, but again, their application is made available to all of those schools. Um, as a counselor, you do have to create an, or an account through this application to upload their transcript. Um, and students might have to complete some additional components on a specific school website. But again, if you have students interested in HBCUs, really great chance to just fill out their information one time and apply to multiple schools at once. Um, the next is the coalition application, and I'll include links to all of these as well in the follow-up email in case there are some that you aren't familiar with. Um, the coalition application has 150 plus member schools. Um, that are really focused on improving access to higher ed. Um, so in Michigan, there are three schools that accept the coalition application, which are Hope, um, Michigan State, and the University of Michigan. Um, and an interesting about this is that they actually have transitioned, um, I think this year. Um, so they're now using SCORE for their application software. So if your school already uses SCORE, your students will be familiar. Um, but any student can apply through the system, even if your school does not currently use SCORE. Um, but again, can be helpful for the schools that accept it. The next one is QuestBridge. And QuestBridge has 48 partners, so a little bit smaller, um, but this is for many of the highly selective institutions. Um, and they have a program, they have a couple of programs, but the main one is a program called National College Match. And so this program specifically focuses on high achieving low income students and they define low income as having a household income under 65,000. Um, so this application is really nice again for those really highly selective institutions like Yale, Brown, Duke, Notre Dame, um, because students can apply to those schools for free and they're considered for early decision. Um, so again, their applications are considered before all of the regular admission cycle. Um, and they're provided a full four-year scholarship. And the website gives them, you know, tons of resources. Again, it's free, but there are those eligibility requirements about income. Um, then many of your EDP tools also have some component of, you know, college application or college application management. Uh, so if you use Zello or Naviance or Score or any of those, um, of course, you have some components in there as well. And then the last one is the common application, which we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into in just a minute. All right, now the components of the application. So of course, each one is going to look a little bit different, but this is kind of the, the general overview of what it'll include. So the actual form will ask for things about their contact information, you know, name, address, email, citizenship, um, one thing I always like to remind students, especially about email, I don't see it as much anymore, but you know, thinking back to 
when I created my first email, you know, it was always like soccer star 97 or, you know, something like that. So we want to make sure that the email is something appropriate, usually like their name at Gmail or Yahoo or something like that. Um, so just make sure that they have an appropriate email. Um, they can use their school email. Um, however, different schools lose access at different times. So, you know, if they're still waiting on admissions decisions in the summer, do they still have access? So I generally recommend, you know, having a specific email for these. Um, it'll also ask you for information about college credits earned. So if they did, you know, dual enrollment, um, it'll ask for parent information, honors and awards, extracurriculars, um, employment, internships. Some applications will give them an option to just upload a resume or a list of activities, which they absolutely can do. Um, but otherwise, it'll ask them for that information. Um, it'll ask about disciplinary information. And yes, students should tell the truth, um, which of course you all know, but a lot of times they ask if they really have to disclose things. Um, and so one of the benefits of some of those, uh, you know, systems like the Common App or QuestBridge or any of those is that you only have to fill out this information one time. However, if you have students using multiple systems or going to school websites, I recommend having this information kind of ready to go in a Word doc or a Google doc so that they can just copy and paste. So, you know, we've all applied for jobs where you have to, you know, upload your resume and then fill in all the things. And, you know, you're filling in all of your work experience over and over again. So same thing, just kind of having this information saved so they can quickly copy and paste it to any application. Um, they will have to submit a transcript or likely you will submit a transcript as a counselor. Um, so usually it'll ask them for a mid-year and a final. Um, some school or some applications might ask them to list out specific grades. So again, making sure they have access to that and all that information. Um, test scores. So many schools are moving to test optional. However, there are still some schools that require it or that it's uh, needed for some of those merit-based aid scholarships. Um, so those are sent directly from the agency. And if they didn't select that school when they took the test, they will have to pay after to have their results sent. Um, but usually in the application, they'll ask for like a self-reported score. So they'll go ahead and enter all of that information. Um, letters of recommendation we're going to talk about in more detail later. Um, and the personal statement. Fees, so not all schools have a fee, but you know some schools will. So making sure they're prepared for that um, or they have applied for fee waivers. Um, and in these systems, you know, like the Common App, there is a fee waiver option in there. Certain schools have fee waivers. Some schools have it before a certain deadline. Um, so making sure that they're aware of those options. And then again, if they are applying for a program that requires an audition or an interview, some type of portfolio to be submitted, um, making sure they have all of that information together as well. All right, so now we're gonna do a deep dive into the Common App. And I picked this just because it is pretty similar to a lot of application systems, but also a lot of students will use this because it is pretty quick and efficient and easy to use. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everyone knows exactly what it, it looks like. Um, so the Common App does have over a thousand partner schools, um, which does include most of the four-year schools in Michigan. There are 32 of them, really just a handful that don't. Um, in the Common App, students can apply up to 20 colleges, um, and it includes some general information and a general essay, um, as well as some specific college-specific uh, college questions. A couple of resources before we even get into that. Oops, not this one. All right. Hopefully my screen share followed my screen. Are you seeing this kind of grid here, the Common App grid? Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so a couple of resources I will send along to you. The first is um, this grid for the Common App. Um, there are many, many ways for students to find the information about what requirements the schools have. Um, but this one, uh, nice, just kind of quick, you know, easy thing to glance at. Um, for each school, it tells you any of their deadlines. So their early action, early decision, are they rolling? Do they have a, you know, specific deadline? 
application fees? Does it require the common app essay? Does it require other essays, um, their testing policy, um, all of that good stuff. So, you know, you can do a quick control F and search through this pretty quickly. The other resource is um, the common app writing requirements. So again, lots of different ways they can find this information. But let's say that they're applying to, you know, Allegheny College. They can type it in there, they can search for it. And it will tell them, do they require the Common App essay? Do they have college specific essays? And so this can be helpful before they get into the application to start working on this stuff early. All right, so jumping over to the Common App here. So if you didn't know, there is an option to create kind of a demo account for educators. Um, so if you go to sign in, you can click create an account. And there is an option here for education professional. So it'll give you, you know, a pretty good look at what the Common App looks like for your students um, without making you, you know, actually try to apply to schools. But then once you have created that, you will sign in just under the first year students part, it's the same thing. I'll go ahead and sign in. And I have added some stuff in here just to try to, you know, simulate what it might look like. So the dashboard here gives them, um, you know, just a quick glance at where they are in terms of their applications. Um, so it tells them if there's deadlines coming up, it tells them if they're in progress or if they've submitted applications. But really the first thing they'll do is they'll go over probably to college search. And so some students automatically have schools that they're interested in. They're gonna say, great, I wanna to apply to Grand Valley. And so we can go ahead and we can search for Grand Valley and we can add that school. Again, students can add up to 20 schools through the Common App. Um, if they're not sure though, um, again, in the previous webinar, we have tons of other tools, but also within the Common App, they can search by certain filters. So they could search you know, by state or country, distance from where they are, the term they're applying for, um, deadlines. So this can be especially helpful. Let's say maybe they've applied to some schools in the fall, maybe they haven't gotten into some of their top schools, and they're looking for schools to apply to later in the spring. So they can go ahead and say, great, I want to apply to a school. You know, I don't want any deadlines before March 15th. They can do that. There is also an option to um, select if there's an application fee. So if they don't want to pay an application fee, they can select that. Same thing with writing requirements, testing, letters of recommendation. They can choose if they don't want to do any of that stuff. I would not necessarily recommend choosing your schools based on that, but um, you know, it is an option if students want to. And so let's say they don't have any specific essays, they don't have a fee. All right, so then we've got our list of schools. And then if they click on it, it'll give them kind of the you know, snapshot profile of the school, when their deadlines are, um, all of that information about testing, fees, essays, um, all of that good stuff. And then if they're interested in it, they can go ahead and click add to my colleges. So once they've done that, their colleges will show up here under the dashboard and under my colleges. But I'm actually gonna go right here to the left and click on common app. So this is the application that is going to be sent to all of these schools. So this is the information that's not specific to a school. It's just gonna be sent out to everyone. So in the common app, it'll ask again for that um, kind of personal information, so their name, the name that they go by. Um, it'll ask for their address. It'll ask for contact details. So again, that email is really important. Um, it asks for demographics. Some of this is not required. So of course, um, it has asterisks if it's required. You know, a lot of this demographic information isn't required. Um, it asks about languages, nationality, and then there is this question about the Common App fee waiver. And so it gives them those specific um, requirements for getting the fee waiver. Um, and then if they meet that, they can click yes. And then they have to, you know, agree to it. Um, and then, yeah, that's all in this part. Um, it will also ask for family information. So it will ask about their parents, any siblings.
Um, it'll ask for their education. So where are they currently at school? Um, have they attended any other high schools? Did they attend any other colleges for like dual enrollment? It'll ask for grades. So we're actually going to talk a little bit more about this later, but this is important information for them to have about, you know, graduating class size, their class rank, all of that information. They'll ask about their current courses, any honors. It'll ask them about community-based organizations. So did anyone help them um, with this application process? And then it'll also ask them about future plans. So kind of what are you hoping to do? What type of degree do you want to earn? Testing. So again, this is that unofficial um, information. They do need to send it from the testing agencies uh, directly, um, but they can report on their ACT or SAT or AP scores here as well. And so after they put in the test that they want to report on, they will get the drop down that opens up for them to put in that information. Then it'll ask about activities. So what have they participated in in high school? Do they want to participate in that thing in college? And then under writing, um, and this is why it's good to have that um, college search done first and actually add those colleges. It will tell you which schools they are interested in um, that require the Common App essay and which ones don't. So not all schools require it. Um, you know, the three I selected, one does. And so then it gives them a ton of different options for prompts. And we're gonna be talking more about personal statements later, um, but they'll get that option here. Um, then it'll give them the option. Um, it'll give them the option uh, to either write um, their essay in here. I would probably just import it from something like Google Drive um, to make sure that the formatting and everything is saved. Um, so that option is here. Um, and then there's also this additional information. So it will give them, um, right now it has questions about COVID-19 still. So they can, you know, say if, um, you know, they had any kind of outstanding circumstances due to that, and it gives them an option to add information there. The last thing, um, so you can see none of the colleges I've selected require this, but some schools will ask them to put in grades. Um, and so usually it's for some specific classes It might ask them, um, but they'll have to go in and put in all of those grades um, separate from their transcript. And I see a couple of questions. Um, can they begin it in 11th grade? So the Common App opens on a specific date um, because it does change slightly year to year. And I believe it opens in the spring. Um, so they couldn't start it too, too early because it will just delete it. Um, and also somewhere back up here, it asks them like when they want to start. And so that information might not all be populated yet. Um, so they could probably start in the very late part of 11th grade. And then does it limit it to certain colleges? Yes. So they do have a thousand um, plus partner schools, but it does not include all schools. So again, if I go to college search here and I select Michigan, you can see that there are 32 schools in Michigan that accept it. So not all schools, you can see um, like Adrian doesn't accept it, but I can see, um, you know, most of the, the community colleges don't accept it generally. Um, yeah, those are a couple that stand out to me. So it does accept um, for most schools in Michigan, but not all of them. All right, so that's, again, just the, the actual common app parts, the application that goes to all schools. The next to that is my colleges. And this is where they'll see those specific questions for each of their schools. So if I click on Elma here, again, it gives them that kind of overview, you know, showing um, when everything is due, showing them those testing or those fees and the testing requirements and all of that. And then each of these, they're honestly pretty similar for most schools, but they will have some differences. Um, you know, it's gonna ask them, what they intend to major in, um, you know, what type of things they want to be involved in. 
again, their major, um, any activities that they hope to be involved in. And then it will, some of the information is repeated. So it will ask them for, you know, contact information and all of that. Um, some of the family information, it'll ask if they're a legacy, if they know anyone who works there or their family works there. And then it will have, all of them will have this recommenders and FERPA section. Um, and so this is where they actually invite people to submit those letters of recommendation that we'll talk about more later. Um, but they'll basically just put in their name, their email. Um, and then it will send that off to that person. And it tells them here what is required versus what is optional. So Alma doesn't actually require any um, letters of recommendation, but it tells them they can, you know, have an optional three teachers, they have an optional, you know, three other people that can submit it. And then it'll have them review everything and submit it. So a little bit different, I'm um, looking at the University of Georgia. One thing I wanted to point out here, again, it'll have, you know, major, what do you want to be involved in, all of that good stuff. But Georgia does also have I can find it down here under writing. They do also have a few supplemental questions um, or one supplemental question. So in addition to that college app essay, some of them might have their own questions. So this one um, asks them to tell an interesting or amusing story about yourself from your high school years that you have not already shared in your application. And so again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later, but just know that some of those, um, some of the schools do have that as well. Um, this, again, another example um, that does have self-reported grades, so it asks for some specific classes um, for them to include their grades. So each application is just a little bit different, pretty similar information, but, you know, will have its own nuances. And then again, that dashboard will show them kind of their progress for each of those schools, so telling them, you know, how close they are to the deadline, is it in progress, is it submitted, all of that good stuff. All right, I know that that was a lot of information in our first 40 minutes. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, then we will just keep chugging along. We might take, depending on time, we might take a quick break after this next section, um, but let me get back to... Where are we? Okay, we get back to this. All right, so moving a little bit, we're gonna talk more about the counselor or educator role. So this is pretty counselor focused, but if you are a teacher, um, you know, there is some information in here for you as well about recommendations. So of course, this again, varies very greatly based on your school structure, the, um, you know, other people that you have supporting this process, what you can handle in terms of capacity, but these are just some recommendations and what students might expect. Um, there was a question, will this be shared? Yes, the recording as well as the presentation and all of the links to resources will be shared afterwards. Um, okay, so counselor's role. So again, we have a whole other presentation about this, but helping students, you know, finding colleges and making a list. Um, and so this can happen, you know, one on one, but of course, understanding your capacity and your caseloads, this might often happen in large group settings. Um, we had, again, a whole other presentation where we talked about a lot of different softwares that are available to help students narrow down their list, um, but also using things like within the Common App, um, you know, to help them find those schools. Um, one best practice, a lot of schools have something like a junior meeting where they meet, and again, this could be a whole group meeting, it could be individually or small groups of students, some meet with students and their parents, um, just to kind of see where students are. Are you thinking college? What are you thinking? What types of schools are you planning to apply to? Um, I know on our Jamboard, a couple of people mentioned um, students having unrealistic expectations. And so sometimes this is where you can talk to students about reach schools versus safety versus target schools um, and really what they should be aiming for. Um, but yeah, so best practice is, you know, trying to have some type of meeting with students their junior year, um, whether that's in individually or in a group. 
um, helping students understand those requirements. So this could even be just having handouts available, things on your website for students to look at. Um, again, regarding testing. So if it says it's test optional versus test blind, you know, what does that actually mean? How does that affect my admissions? Um, you know, do I need to take this test over again? Um, helping them understand how to write the personal statement. Um, and then also, you know, the different types of deadlines. So again, early decision versus early action um, versus, you know, rolling and regular admissions. Um, the counselor typically will be the person to send the transcript unless you have, you know, like a, a registrar or an administrative assistant or something that's doing that. Um, and then counselors also typically will be writing recommendations and submitting school profiles. Oh, I just realized my captions turned off. Okay. Um, so a couple of different things that you um, might have, you know, helped put together or that you might run into. Um, the first is a school report. And so this will be um, asked of you for some student applications. And this will list information like the student's transcript, the GPA scale that your school uses, the curriculum, you know, some specific questions to give them some context about the student. And then there is the school profile. And this, again, helps provide admissions context about your school. So this is really helpful, especially if you have a student who is applying to a school that maybe you haven't had a lot of students go to before, um, and they're just not as familiar with who you are. And so the school profile really should have some specific components. Um, it should include contact information, um, school information like demographics, um, what type of community are you in, um, you know, percentage of students who participate in low income programs, any special recognitions or honors, uh, information about your curriculum. Um, so any available academic programs, what AP classes or honors classes do you have? Do you have IB? Um, any special tracks available in your school? Um, and any specific graduation requirements. Uh, it should also include information about how your GPA is calculated. So is it weighted or unweighted? What, you know, does the weighted scale look like? Um, test scores, so, you know, SAT or ACT, median range, AP scores, how do students typically do? How is class rank determined? Um, and then some idea of post-secondary plans of recent grads. So what types of schools did your students go to? And I have here, I have a couple of examples of some school profiles. Let me find those just to kind of give you an idea. And so again, sometimes the counselors um, are responsible for putting this together. Sometimes it's, you know, administration. So it just depends on your school. Um, but just in case you're looking for something different, you know, a few older examples, but this one is from a high school in Alabama, um, kind of a, a tri-fold situation. Again, giving all their contact information, giving an idea of their class. So how many students are there? Um, you know, how many national merit finalists they had, their ACT scores. Um, what their future plans were. And then the backside um, kind of gives information about uh, their grading, their GPA weighted, um, or how it's weighted, um, any requirements for graduation, AP schedule, tells you that they're on a block schedule versus a you know, trimester or whatever, um, dual enrollment, all of that stuff. Then we have this school in Maryland. They have this kind of fast facts. And this can also be really helpful for your students. So if you don't have this already on your website, a lot of schools will put it under like the About Us section or the counseling page, um, because this is helpful for them while they're filling out their application and they have to know, okay, how many people are in my graduating class or you know that kind of information. Um, so again, this one's a little bit more narrative, gets some fast facts. The back that is mostly kind of achievement and accomplishment focused talks about some partners that they have, their AP test results. So again, just providing some context to the school um, about your school. This one has a little bit of color, you like that. Um, this one's a little bit longer though, five pages, um, but you know, goes pretty in depth with their curriculum. Again, AP courses offered, all the same information, but then also provides the sampling of colleges. 
I personally really like this one from Berkeley here in Michigan. A um, little bit more color, but also provides all that same information, contact information. Um, again, those great equivalents. So you saw uh, a couple of these, you know, an A was a 90%, whereas at this school, an A is a 94%. So again, good context for a college. And then the backside lists all of their kind of curriculum, AP classes offered, schools that their students are going to, et cetera. So again, I'll include all of these links as well, but just to kind of, again, give you another idea of what these school profiles could look like. But again, really the focus here is giving um, colleges context about your school. All right, moving on, we're gonna talk about recommendations. And we're gonna do this kind of a, a two-pronged approach. Um, and so first I wanna kind of quickly instruct, uh, talk about how to instruct students to ask for letters. Um, because most students likely have never had to ask for a recommendation or a reference before. Um, it's definitely a learned skill. Um, so how can we help students be successful in that? And then we'll talk about as an educator, how to write a good letter of recommendation. Um, so recommendations help give the admissions staff um, a more complete picture of an applicant, um, how they perform in the classroom, in teams, et cetera. Um, and again, this is the process that really kind of be begins long before the application, as those students have to cultivate positive relationships with their teachers and their coaches and staff. Um, so who to ask um, really depends on the school they're applying to. Um, some of them will give them very specific people. Um, they'll say, you know, we need one teacher in an academic subject, we need a counselor, and we need another person, or we need two teachers and this person. Um, so it just depends on the school. Um, if they ask for a teacher in an academic subject, that generally is referring to English, social studies, science, math. Um, however, it could also mean um, like if they're planning to major in vocal performance, probably the choir teacher or something would be a good person to ask. Um, some schools do allow them to ask employers or coaches or other personal connections. Um, and so that can be good for kind of like a, a final one. Uh, students should make sure they're asking people that they know well and consider the context. So Teachers are going to be able to speak to, you know, their class participation, their academics, whereas a coach or an employer is going to have a very different viewpoint of the student and be able to talk about different skills. Um, it is generally best to ask teachers um, or people they've had more recently, so junior or senior year especially, because they kind of have the freshest memories of the student. However, if they had a teacher their, you know, first and second year in high school that they had a really great connection with, like, they absolutely can't ask them. Um, but just, you know, again, think about the context and who's going to be able to speak most highly about them. If it does give them options, let's say it just says any three people, they do want to make sure they ask at least one to two teachers because, of course, they're going to college to, you know, pursue academics and their teachers are going to be able to speak to their academics. Um, when to ask early, as early as possible. Um, at least a month in advance of any application deadlines, but honestly, I'd recommend students asking, you know, in the summer, give them time, let them know specific deadlines. Um, but, you know, the earlier they can ask them, uh, the more likely they are to get a yes, because, you know, when we get into mid fall semester or late fall semester, teachers will be inundated with requests for um, recommendations and so again as early as possible and obviously same with counselors counselors will fill out so many recommendations um, so the earlier the students can ask the better um, how to ask in person is best um, you know stopping in and having a conversation but of course if they need to you know send an email that's fine um, I always recommend students provide some information to the person to kind of help them know what to talk about um, so whether that's a resume or a list of activities or projects or a brag sheet, something that helps the recommender know, you know, what kind of points they want them to hit on. It's also good to tell the recommender about post-secondary plans. So what schools are you applying to? What majors are you looking at? What do you hope to be involved in? Things that could help them uh, build that recommendation. Um, and then usually the system will send a link to the recommender through the application portal. 
Um, so usually they're not going to get a physical copy of the letter or an email copy of the letter. It's usually going to be submitted directly through that. So usually they'll put in the email address um, and they should of course only do that after they have asked someone to be a recommender. Um, it is okay to follow up as they get close to the deadline. So let's say they ask them a couple months in advance. It's getting close. They haven't seen it submitted yet. Um, it is okay to ask, uh, you know, to follow up with it. Um, but I always recommend students ask something like, is there other information you need to complete it? Um, you know, not saying like the deadline's coming up. I really need this done, which I actually, I had a recommendation for a student for grad school this year. And that is what she said to me. <laughs> I really need this done next week. Um, which is not, not really the best way to approach it. So, um, you know, asking if there's anything else that they need from you to be able to complete that. Um, and also making sure that students thank their recommenders. That takes so much time and effort on their part to submit all of these. They're doing it for so many students. So really making sure that they thank them can go a long way. I do have another example here. I have an example here um, from the Common App for uh, a brag sheet. So this is again an example of something that they could give their counselor or they could give a teacher. Um, you know, asking them to describe their activities that they've been involved in. How would they describe themselves? Um, again, what are kind of their future plans? So information like this again can be really helpful to the recommender. Um, so if you provide something like this to your student. Um, you know, either this or something you have created that can be really helpful. All right, jumping back here again. All right, so now looking at it from the educator's perspective, um, so again, if given the option, you know, counselors and teachers are going to have different um, unique perspectives to provide. Um, counselors can provide kind of that view of an applicant within the context of, a, you know, their whole graduating class or the school, um, while teachers viewpoint is from the classroom. Um, again, collecting that information, you can ask students for their resume or their brag sheet, um, you know, collect through some type of student information form. And especially as counselors, you know, a lot of these applications do require a, a counselor um, recommendation. So, you know, determining whatever process it is that you are going to have for getting those requests from students and the type of information that you want to uh, collect. When you're writing these recommendation, recommendations, um, it's important to kind of become a storyteller. And I know this, this all sounds like a lot when you have such a high caseload and you have so many students you're doing this for, but really the more personalized you can be in these letters, the better for students. Um, you don't wanna regurgitate information that's on their application. So you're not just gonna, again, list out the classes they took or their, you know, the things that they were involved in. Um, any anecdotes you can use are really helpful. Um, a shorter, more personalized letter is better than a longer generic letter. Um, usually schools are looking for a page. Um, how has the student stood out to you? So what makes them different from other students? Why is the student a good match for that particular school? If you have knowledge about that. Um, personal information. So if you know that, you know, a student's parent passed away while they were in 10th grade and their grades suffered because of that, um, you know, kind of providing some of that context, but also be wearing, uh, beware of FERPA. Um, so revealing information only is permitted. Um, and also it's really helpful if the recommendation kind of has a theme or a focus to it. Um, ask the students what they want admissions to know that isn't already reflected in the rest of their application. Kind of the specifics, like I said, most schools are looking for a one page, two pages max. Um, one kind of, uh, option for writing this, the first paragraph kind of sharing an anecdote, talking about student strengths, what comes to mind when you think of this student. The body paragraphs, really thinking about what helps make their application comprehensive. So 
you know, if they are going to play, you know, I don't know why I keep bringing up soccer, but like if they go to play soccer in college and you know that they've asked their soccer coach to write a recommendation, then you probably don't need to talk all about soccer as well. So thinking about what helps to make them look at like a whole complete student. Um, so are others focusing on specific aspects? Some areas you might want to talk about are character or personality, their extracurriculars, their academics, any of those special circumstances you're aware of, um, and social. How do they interact with others? How would they, you know, contribute to that school? And then the last part, again, what will the student offer their future community? So how are they going to impact that school? There is another method um, that some schools really like. Again, this is all very subjective. Um, but some schools like this called the organized narrative style. And this style uses bullet points. Um, schools like it because it's pretty, you know, to the point, they can quickly skim it and see what's going on. Um, some schools really like it and some don't. Um, but I'd be really interested to hear, does anyone have experience with this style? Have you heard any, you know, positives or negatives when using it? Or what have you found to be successful when writing or writing recommendations? Anyone have any personal experience or personal, you know, feedback you've received? And again, I'm going to switch around here, pull up an example of that narrative style. Maybe, I think I know. Okay, so this is an example of that um, organized narrative style. And so it really focuses on a few specific aspects. So it talks about academic history. And again, uses some specific bullet points. Talks about their activities and their interests. Areas of impact. So again, a little bit different, um, but is an option. I also like this resource from MIT. Um, they share some different example letter of recommendation and tell you why they like it or why they don't like it. Um, and one that I thought was really helpful is, this one. So um, this one you can see is, you know, probably not the full letter, but pretty short. Um, you know, counselor said, I don't really know Mike very well. He's come to me for routine matters, but generally he's not had any problems that he's discussed with me. In this large school, I do not always have the time to personally get to know each of my advisees. From the comments I get, I have the impression he's one of the strongest students this school has seen. And so they say this actually can, you know, be good. It's not, they don't get a lot from uh, this recommendation. Um, but the counselor's honest, they're not left guessing why there's not more information, and they're probably going to look at, you know, some other recommendations. So if you find yourself, you know, having to complete tons of these recommendations and you don't get to know every one of your students, you know, personally, it is okay to, you know, put something like this and be honest. Yes, some colleges definitely do prefer the list. Good. All right, so now we're gonna just take a quick little break. I know this has been, again, a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, I'm putting up this sketch code here for those who do watch the recording and are looking for those sketches. Again, if you are here live, you don't need to do anything with this code, don't worry about it. Um, but we're just gonna take a quick five minute break. So let's come back at 10.08. And feel free to put any questions in the chat or Q&A as you are breaking as well.
All right, we're going to start on our last section before we get to um, some of our best practices and brainstorming session. Um, and so this is going to be about how to help your students um, write a standout essay. Um, so for these personal statements, um, generally, uh, some, some applications will have uh, specific word limits. Um, so like the Common App recommends 650 words, which is a little over two pages, double spaced, a um, little over, you know, like a page and a quarter, single spaced. Um, but those supplemental questions are generally much shorter. So again, they might give you a limit, but usually it's somewhere between like 150 to 300 words. Um, you know, so a little bit shorter than the personal statement. The key word here is personal. So especially when students are applying to, you know, more highly selective schools, they really want to sound super intellectual and um, so they'll try to make it super formal. But really the point of the personal statement is to help the admissions rep get a better sense of who the student is. So they've seen their academic credentials, they've seen their activities, they've seen all of that information on paper, but how can the student help them to better see who they are? Um, so it is best to write the personal statement using I statements. Um, and again, not trying to be too intellectual or stuffy and really just giving them a chance to get to know who they are. Um, they shouldn't repeat their application verbatim. So they're not gonna just list out their you know, accomplishments or the classes they've taken or the activities they've participated in. They really want to give them more. Um, so helping them see what makes them unique. A lot of admissions reps recommend writing the way that you speak, um, of course, following proper grammar and syntax and all of that, but you know, generally writing more in the way that you speak. Um, when it comes to choosing a topic, so like you saw in the Common App, they gave, I think, you know, eight or nine different options. And really there's no correct option, one's not better than the other. It really just needs to be whatever one the student can use to tell a better story. Um, and as they tell a story, they really want to be narrative, they want to use imagery, they can use dialogue and quotes and things if that really helps the story. Um, but again, it's really supposed to be personal and telling a story. They also want to make sure that they start with a hook. You know, admissions reps are reading so many essays. And if they, you know, read every essay that says, I wanted to be a teacher since I was six years old, you know, that can probably get a little bit boring. Whereas if the student kind of plops them into the middle of a story, um, the middle of a situation, it can make it a little bit more exciting. It hooks the reader and makes them want to learn more about that student. And really the thing to consider isn't um, what the school wants to know, but rather what do this, does the student want the school to know about them? So are there any things missing in their application? What is the kind of one lasting thing that the student wants the admissions reps to know? So some schools um, may have kind of general uh, personal statement prompts where others might be more specific. So kind of general would be, you know, in one page, tell us about yourself. Or in 500 words or less, describe your academic and career objectives. So again, still using that idea of telling a story, um, but these are of course a little bit more broad. Whereas others are gonna be a lot more specific. So tell us about a personal quality, talent, accomplishment, contribution, or experience that is important to you. What about this quality or accomplishment makes you proud and how does it relate to the person you are? So a little bit more specific, Again, either way, whether they, you know, give them options between the two or whether, you know, they give them one or the other, it's really still the same structure. And like I mentioned, there will be, you know, the essays, the personal statements that are longer, um, but there also may be some of those supplemental questions. So like when we looked at the Common App, we saw that question asking, um, oh, what was it? Something that was interesting about them. Um, there's not a right or wrong answer to these. It's really all about the way that they write it. Um, some other types of supplemental questions that are pretty popular are, you know, why this specific college or why this major? Um, some are more creative, you know, like what song should your admissions counselor listen to while reviewing your application? So again, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's really just being able to convey whatever they're trying to through their statement. Um, some questions that students can 
could consider as they're working on these personal statements. Um, thinking about what's distinctive or unique about their story, um, what details might help admissions understand them better, when and why did they become interested in this field or school, what are their goals, are there any gaps or discrepancies in their application that they need to clarify, what are their top skills, and what are the most compelling reasons they can give to be considered for admission. So of course they're not going to answer all these questions in the statement, but just some things to kind of get them thinking, um, you know, to really help formulate their story. Some personal statements, do's and don'ts. So they do need to make sure they're answering the question that is being asked. So they can't just choose to answer something else. Um, they do need to answer that specific question. Um, again, do tell a story, find an angle, use a theme, be specific write well and proofread and using a clean and professional format. Don't use a ton of cliches or generalities. Don't use a generic statement for every application and there's some caveats there. Um, and don't preach or whine or condescend or repeat info from you know, the rest of their application. Um, as far as a generic statement goes, of course, when we're looking at like the Common App, there is that one generic essay and it is okay to use um, you know, parts of the statement for multiple schools, even for those um, school specific questions. But it is important to make sure that they're answering the specific question asked and that they're addressing that specific school. So if the school is asking like, why are you interested in our program or our school? It is important to make sure that they've shown they've done their research. They understand, you know, what makes this school different than another school um, and not just, I've always been interested in this thing. So some recommendations for helping them put it together. Um, the standard essay is going to use, you know, an introduction, a couple body paragraphs, and a conclusion, just like any other essay. The overall essay should exhibit a theme, so it shouldn't just be a bunch of choppy paragraphs talking about, you know, five different things, but really kind of a cohesive theme throughout. And again, using a narrative hook to help capture the reader's attention, making them want to learn more about the student. One method I recommend to students to use is called the peel method. Um, and so this is kind of for each of their paragraphs. So the first is point. Um, so having that topic sentence, what is the point that they're trying to make? Evidence, so helping to make their point. What evidence supports it? You know, giving stories, using that narrative. Explanation, so you've made the point, now help explain it. So we're, we really want to show, not tell. Um, why is it relevant to, you know, what you're pursuing? And then linking it to the next paragraph. All right, some tips on writing it. Um, use specific language. Um, again, these aren't super, super long essays. They're, you know, 500 to 650 words. So one page, single spaced. Um, so, you know, never use two words when one will do. Don't try to be too wordy. Um, delete warm up sentences and get to the point. So, you know, we don't need a ton of introduction into stuff, just really get to the point that they're trying to make. Um, again, abstract versus concrete. So, don't tell them, you know, try to show them, try to plop them into a story or a narrative to help them understand what's going on. Write drafts. So again, I mentioned earlier, just like a teacher would say, you know, don't, you know, turn in the first draft of your essay or spend some time working on this. Um, it really is important to make sure that they're going through multiple drafts, they're having people review it. Um, you know, even giving people the essay without giving them the prompt to see kind of what they gathered from it, making sure that others review it. But some other things to consider, you know, does it flow? Again, is it personal? Do, does it help them better understand them as a person? Does it answer the prompt and does it grab your attention? All right, so now I am going to split us up into some groups and I'm gonna give you a couple of different essays to take a look at. Um, so some of you will get essay A and B and some of you will get essay one and two. And so 
each set of essays is written by the same student. And one is kind of a before and one is kind of an after, just to give you an idea of what a good and a bad essay looks like. And so in your groups, um, I want you to take a look at each essay and you know figure out what works and what doesn't about you know the before and the after. Um, you know what changed, how did it improve? So I'm going to I'll put those links in the chat right now, actually. Here. Just stop sharing for a second here. All right, so essay A. And you should be able to see these when you get into your breakout rooms as well. Let me put those links here real quick. All right, so we got essay A. And again, so each, and I'll, I'll let you know which group you're in, but each one you'll either have A and B or one and two. And then we will come back together and talk about what you liked, what you didn't like. All right, and the sharing permission should all be good. Okay. So when I put you into your room, there should be a box that pops up and it's going to either say essay A, B, or essay one, two. So let me go ahead and open those up. And we're gonna spend about 15 minutes in the room. So hopefully we'll give you time um, to read through them and then also to discuss. And then we'll come back together and talk about what you liked and didn't like. And of course it reset my room. So let me do that again real quick. All right, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms now. We've got about half of our people back in the breakout rooms. These are all closing now. And I apologize, I said 15 minutes, but I forgot I said it for 12 minutes. So hopefully you had enough time to read and discuss. All right, let me share that again. All right, so I would love to hear from the groups that had essay A and B. So that was the football player. Let's start with um, essay A here. So what, what worked or didn't work about that essay? I was kind of looking forward to reading the second one because I know you said like, there's the first one and then like the second one is like the follow-up or the one that maybe had some corrections in it but at first I was like yeah, someone said this horse was his BFF <laughs> I was like where is this Absolutely. going so, yeah yeah and feel free to put those in the chat or you can even just um turn your mic on
Yeah, so like I mentioned before, we wanna make it sound like the way we speak. And I'm going to assume that this, you know, probably 12th grader probably does not use like words like ergo or promulgated or maudlin in his everyday conversation or their everyday conversation. Abhorrent. Yeah, so definitely use the thesaurus pretty heavily here. Unnatural word choices. Um, sounds a little bit pretentious in, in some areas. Um, you know, I'm certain your school would benefit from my miraculous academic transformation. Um, the second paragraph seems a little bit out of place. It's kind of more of like the conclusion, like coming back around to like, I'm, I'm doing something else now. Football's on hold. That's okay. Um, the parts down here where he starts talking about, you know, classes and participating and meeting with people are all a little bit generic. It's not really telling a story. It's, you know, saying I participated in class. I spent time with different people. It's not really anything, you know, unique or, or telling anything. And then, yeah, that final paragraph, a little bit braggy and not in a good way. We want to make sure that we're, you know, showing our best self in the personal statement, but without being too braggy. All right, so SAB, kind of the, the after for this student, what worked better in this essay? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. I felt like I was chatty before and then I didn't know. Um, I just thought the second one just flowed a lot better. It was a lot easier to understand, like a lot easier. Like it was nice that you gave us that warning ahead of time that like the second one was like the follow-up but it just, it just made a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. And I just realized my sound wasn't on. So if someone did try to talk before, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just chatting away, <laughs> but I basically said before what I just said. Now, so. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, definitely um, easier to read. Um, I said more conversational, less complaining. Yeah, it's specific. There's more personal stories in this, you know, giving the example of the specific history class, you know conversational, the appropriate tone. Um, the essay does come, you know, full circle in this one. You know, so again, having that paragraph kind of move to the end where football is still on hold, but you know, doing this other thing. Yeah, it's great. He shared what he learned from the experience. Absolutely. So really important for that self-reflection in um, the personal statement. All right, moving on to our other groups, um, essay one. What, what about this essay? This is the person who wanted a cat. Talked about having a cat, an animal. I was um, telling our group, I'm a middle school counselor, so I don't have a lot of experience with these personal essays yet. Um, so as I started reading it, I was really surprised. I'm like, where is this going? <laughs> We're talking about a dog and a cat. Um, but, um, so yeah, it was surprising to me and reading this, the revi revised one, it made a little bit more sense, but um, that was the first thing that came to mind. I'm like, I know that they're supposed to be talking about their personal experiences and mm -hmm. personal, add a personal touch, but um, this one jumped around a lot and it was really hard to follow. Yes, that is perfect. Yeah, so this one is personal, right? Like they're giving their experience, but this is barely common for those, um, those prompts that are like, tell me about the most inspirational person to you, or who's the most important information, or, you know, if you could meet any historical person, who would it be? Where it focuses too much on the other person, or in this case, the animal. Really, it's not focusing on the students, you know, personal qualities or their skills. It's really focusing on other people and the animal. Another thing with this one is this paragraph here, they talk about um, their abuela dying. Um, and it is okay for students to mention trauma um, and you know things in their personal statement. But again, this one doesn't really tie back to themselves or what you know they learned or how they grew from that experience. It, it just kind of is a traumatic thing that they just put in here. Again, it doesn't really tie together. If you scroll down to the last one, um, if I'm not mistaken, does this person mentioned like the uh, characteristics of their attributes because of what, how they relate to the pet. Did I miss that? 
it's at the very bottom about, oh, compassion, responsibility, mm-hmm. loyalty, and joy. So I think that was one good thing that yeah. maybe could have been pulled into the re- revised one. Yeah. And this one, so yeah, the very, very end, they do kind of mention that there, but would have been nice to sprinkle it throughout, you know, and really showing that self-reflection and, you know, being able to talk about their own personal qualities. And so then similarly, you know, essay two, any, any thoughts on that we haven't already mentioned? The things that stand out. I still think this one um, really focused a lot on the dog as opposed to the person. They did bring in their personal thoughts for like one little sentence to wrap it back to them. But um, the idea is good that you can gain inspiration from anyone, a person, an animal, whatever. But the focus was on the dog too much as opposed to the lessons that they learned. Yep, exactly. Same thing I got. And this one I do like, um, I think that this student uses pretty appropriate uses of dialogue and and um, I think they have a quote somewhere, you know, down here. Um, and so again, it is okay for students to use that. I think that this is a good example of using that. But yeah, again, this one does still have a little bit too much focus on the animal, um, but does have more, you know, woven in about their, you know, personal qualities. Good. Well, I hope that that was helpful just to kind of see again what we're talking about in terms of, you know, being narrative and really trying to help them plop them into the story. So, you know, again, this first student, even the the, the first example, you know, I started out and I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I, I feel like I'm in it, right? A defensive linebacker, linebacker mauled me. Um, you know, they didn't just say I was playing a football game. Um, so it did start off, you know, narrative, but it just derailed a little bit from there. Great. The other thing I was going to mention is, um, again, when they're asking for like an experience that changed you or or something like that, you know, some of the essays that admissions reps say, you know, they're they're kind of sick of reading um, or that they try to stay away from um, is making sure students aren't, you know, having kind of a savior complex. So again, making sure that they are able to articulate how the experience changed them or how it impacted them. Um, while focusing on themselves. All right, any questions before we move into, and actually questions can go with this as well. I wanted us to get a little bit of time here um, to share some best practices. So whether that's about the things that we talked about, if you've used any of these and it's worked well for you, um, or other things that you're doing in your schools that you know, you found to be um, helpful as it relates to student applications. So again, go ahead and feel free to put those in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and spend some time sharing. Anyone have a best practice they want to share? Or again, this could also be, you know, questions for the group. If there's anything you want to kind of brainstorm. One thing that stood out in the Jamboard again was that um, point about um, support at home. So if students don't have that support, how are they filling out these applications? Um, One best practice for that is if you're able to have some type of, whether it's specifically for FAFSA or for application, um, but having you know events surrounding that, whether that's during the school day um, or if you need to have it at night, but having events, you can have community members come in, admissions reps are happy to come to these types of events to help your students. Um, but you know, having kind of a dedicated time for them to work on things, even if it's just getting through one application so they can get their questions out there, they can get some feedback on things, um, but just giving them that dedicated time and space. 
I know hopefully this isn't a problem for as many students, but you know, when I was applying to college, my family was a long holdout and we had dial up internet until 2013. And so it was so hard for me to apply to colleges because I didn't really have transportation. I lived in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, I didn't really have easy access to the internet. So I literally only applied to three schools throughout the whole span of the year because it took me so long to complete an application. And so if I knew that I could go to my, you know, counselor's office and, you know, sit down at a computer and work on it, and maybe that was an option, I just didn't pay attention. But, you know, making sure that students know that they have resources or a dedicated time or space to work on it can be really helpful, especially for those students that might not have that support at home. Because, you know, you have those students who have, you know, the adults in their lives that are pushing them to do it, and it's almost, you know, too much the other way, but you know, you definitely do have those students in your school that need that kind of dedicated time and space. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah, having a session during parent-teacher conferences to help get parents involved. Yeah, and like I mentioned with, you know, even those junior meeting ideas, you know, some schools, like I mentioned, some schools will have those meetings with the student and their parents, um, some have, you know, presentations for, you know, the adults in their lives um, to make sure that they, you know, can better understand the process too. Because even for those who aren't first gen, the process has changed a lot in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. So even from the time that they applied, it could be very different. Yes, I think that's the key. I think the takeaway from today is that the application process has changed so much. And so it may also be helpful to uh, educate the parents on ways in which the process of applying to college has changed and helping students, um, you know, maybe also doing during a class period or class session, um, you know, one of the things could be very helpful so that you don't I uh, isolate those students who may need additional resources or support, but don't want to ask for those additional resources okay. and support is maybe going into the class or going into, you know, an English class or something like that and talking about applications and things like that. Maybe even going into the computer lab and, and being able to, you know, dedicate some time during class to do it. Absolutely. I love that. I know it's hard to, you know, get teachers to carve out class time, but definitely can be a great option. Anything else, best practices or questions that you want to, you know, pose to the group? And I lost my thing again. Just check to make sure there's nothing in the Q&A. Do I not have a Q&A? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to talk about that in just a second through elementary counselors. All right. Well, I hope that this has been beneficial to you, whether again, you've been doing this a long time or you needed a refresher or needed some new tools. I really hope that you gained something from this today. Again, you will receive the recording and the presentation and all of the resources. Um, hopefully today, maybe tomorrow, um, ish. Um, but if you do have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Hopefully, my sharing again. Um, my email is up here on the screen. I know Donella joined us. Donella is another one of our um, consultants. I know that she shared her email. We also have our new consultant who just joined us, Catherine Goldberg. Um, so she's on here, and she'll be reaching out to schools that she's assigned to. Um, about the sketches, so there was a code. However, if you are joining us live, you don't need it. You're already counted. You're good. So if you're joining us for the recording later, um, then you'll find that code in the middle of the presentation. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we do have a couple of more, a couple of more, a couple more PDs coming up. So we have one more in this Navigating College Prep session, um, series, um, and that's going to be March 14th. And that one is specifically focused on helping students make decisions. So they've applied, they're accepted. You know, how do they go forward from there? Kind of what's the next steps? 
Um, yes, correct. Your sketches are good. You are, they'll automatically be put in from you joining the Zoom session. Um, and then we also have our career readiness network. And so those are in-person sessions and we have two more left. The next one is next week, January 19th. And that one is gonna be at Amway um, in Ada, um, just outside of Grand Rapids. And that one is focused on employability skills. So we're gonna be there, we're gonna be doing a tour. We're gonna hear from tons of different employees about the skills that they're looking for and how to help students develop those. Um, and then our last one on April 20th is I think going to be at the ISB, Kent ISB building. Um, and that one is going to be focused on uh, apprenticeships and skilled trades. And so we're gonna hear from some different people about how to get your students connected to those. Um, we also have some other PDs available, our um, educator spotlight series, our career chats that are always available. Um, all of those are virtual and are also recorded for sketches um, available after as well. Um, for those elementary and middle school counselors, I know you've been asking for um, some college prep sessions focused for you. I do not have a date yet, but I will get it very soon. I've been working on presentations for you specifically um, focused more on college awareness and just helping your students understand that that is an option for them and kind of how to get there once they do get to high school. So I will make sure you all, um, you all get all of that information as soon as it's available. All right, any last minute questions? I'll hang on for a couple of minutes here. Um, but again, you'll get this recording and the resources after. Nothing you need to do for your sketches, you are good. And I'll go back to my email here just in case you need that. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining. I hope you have a great rest of your day.